listening to She Rises, a podcast dedicated to women who are ready to stop settling and start living their lives by design. If you're ready to talk about the stuff that weighs you down and get practical advice on everything from your health, body image, spirituality, relationships, and personal growth, then you're in the right place. Hello, I'm Giovanna Capoza, your host, master coach, spiritual teacher, and mind body expert, and I'm on a mission to unsettle women all over the world. Are you ready to rise? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Giovanna Capoza. I am your host, and here today with me is Catherine Garceau. Catherine is an Olympic medalist from Sydney 2000 and the author of Swimming Out of Water. After her career as a synchronized swimmer, which led her to perform in aquatic shows in Las Vegas, her journey of dealing with disordered eating, hypersensitivities, and autoimmune conditions led her to discover powerful tools and a new purpose. Since then, she's helped hundreds of women struggling with similar issues and is now taking this comprehensive coach healer model to elite individuals like top athletes who have won Stanley Cups, majors in the LPGA, and competed in two or more Olympic Games and entrepreneurs who are building million dollar companies. Catherine uses EFT, emotional freedom techniques, and other tools, including body work, to investigate this shadow of achievement, releasing limiting patterns and discovering new leverage for growth. Catherine, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Giovanna. It's really uh, an honor to be on your show. So great to have you. I love it. I love what you've been up to. I love what you're done. You know, your journey with disordered eating you know, that plays a a special place in my heart with my own journey and people close to me that have had to deal with this. And so many women who, you know, may not label how they use food as an eating disorder or disordered eating, but this essential kind of element or theme that we see with emotional eaters. So I'm particularly interested in that, but I love everything that you're up to and doing. And I would just love to hear more about that. So would you tell us a little bit more? I know I read to the audience a bit about your story, but tell us a little bit more of how you got on your heel journey and what that's done for you. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I ended a synchronized swimming career with an Olympic medal and I was actually the team captain for the following two years. I was going to go to the next game. So halfway through that journey, I really hit a wall and I was watching myself binge after training for stopping Canada, we, we have Tim Hortons. So I was talking to Tim Hortons and <laughs> for those of you not the was... <laughs> for the non-Canadian <laughs> listeners, that's our version of like Starbucks, but it's uh, in my opinion, not as good, but that we'll say yeah. that we'll keep that to the Canadians. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like better than Dunkin Donuts. Like it's in between Dunkin it's, Donuts it is. and Starbucks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, but we, di- we digress. This is for the Canadian listeners. We digress. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. And so I would just stop and binge eat on my way home and then I would feel so guilty. I would use laxatives. And that was my cycle that began kind of a dark journey and feeling very out of control. Hmm. And when I seek help for that from psych, like I was always someone who wanted the help. I never would hide things. And I asked our sports psychologist, like, this is an issue. I need to like figure this out. And then I was put on Prozac by a psychiatric like specialist I saw. He said it would help and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is weird. So right away, I felt a disconnect from what I was being told. And I felt really disconnected from my body. And wow, it was in 2002. We were in where were we? Switzerland for the World Cup. And we were in a circle. And before we perform in synchronized swimming, a lot of teams really, we do a focus group and we're all facing each other. It's kind of like our last, last powwow before we go and perform. And we were going through the routine. And all of a sudden, I heard from above a voice. And it said, this is your last swim and (laughs) it was so real and true and I knew right in that moment that it was time to stop because I wasn't getting any better and I was really I wasn't hiding it from my help team but I was hiding it from my team team because I was the leader I was the captain so yeah so you uh, had to have your you know what together basically so you couldn't tell them Yes. So I retired right there. Like literally I swam and I had a couple of tears before we swam. And then at the air, like I told our sports psychologist on the bus back to the hotel that wow. day. And I was like, I'm really done. And then I told the team at the airport, we we're like still in that country. And it was interesting because I never had regrets about that. Like I was just like, it was so clear. And 
I think for a lot of athletes, or even this relates to have, being in a job that's kind of done or a relationship that's done, and you hear the voice and you know clearly, but you're just petrified because mm-hmm. it's your life. Like that's all you know in the moment. And in hindsight, I'm really happy and grateful that I did listen because had I continued, I think it just would have like led down an even darker uh, path. And funny enough, like I thought it was going to be my solution. Like I'll just retire and now I can focus on eating well and having only to finish school. So for sure I'll get better. Life had a different plan. (laughs) As it always does. Yep. (laughs) Yes. So I gained a whole bunch of weight and I was even more out of control with food and then even more ashamed, of course, because I was this like ex-Olympian that weighed more than 200 pounds and it was really scary. But at the same time, like it just opened up a whole new, gosh, exploration of life. And that's really when my personal growth journey, if you want to call it, started. I began looking at different books and Lucky enough, I, I ended up dating a really awesome chiropractor who already had like natural healing books. And I would look in their library like, why aren't we eating gluten-free? Why are we doing this? And I started exploring all the things that were causing my system to really be in overload and in just high anxious states, whether it be mentally or physiologically, which sends the same signals to your nervous system. And that's kind of how I began that down that rabbit hole of the body mind connection and food intolerances and everything that some I think places for eating disorders aren't now they are but they weren't talking about that years ago it was really all like a mental problem that you had to look at why do you want to control your life and you know it's like there's a lot of other factors here so I want to go there actually I want to go there about the other factors and stuff because we kind of go back to the beginning because you said something you said you know I started to go to Tim Hortons and binge eat and then take laxatives but if you go back to that time, was there something going on, you know, in your psyche or in your emotional life that you could pinpoint now, probably at the time you couldn't, but was there something going on? Like what was the trigger for you that was causing you to go and binge eat and then take a laxative? Mm -hmm. I think there was for sure an emotional, uh, I mean, a huge emotional component, which later on, I mean, I haven't really shared this publicly. I don't even think I'll ever write about it because I feel like or maybe I will, but I mean, I had a sexual abuse that I only remembered four years ago now. So from the perspective of your nervous system, even Gary Craig, who's the founder of EFT tapping, and we'll, we can talk about that later. He talks about any addiction being unresolved anxiety. And sometimes, unfortunately, those sources of anxiety have been really like camouflaged or stuck from our memory and trauma somehow right exactly Mm -hmm. like yeah and small t and big t traumas can be affecting us years after or even resurface all of a sudden you're like why what's happening to me so that could be a part of what was going on back then which i only found out years later even after i published swimming out of water so at the time though you weren't aware of something like the time you weren't let's say stressed out of like nervous about competition or stressed out about your role as team captain or at the time you just noticed you were unconsciously driving there pigging out and then feeling guilty yeah i was always a perfectionist don't get me wrong so i always had that kind of worry work kind of personality and even early on my mother recognized that and she had my sister used to swim uh in a older team when we were younger and she had both of us go to a sort of psychologist just for me to start like having little tools mentally because she could Mm. see how hard I was on myself that again could have been a symptom of other things but it was in my personality and the food and the eating I mean I always wanted to look good in a bathing suit but I don't think more than the other girls and I think growing older and then time off, like when I had two weeks off for Christmas or even in the summer, I did have like a complete sugar kind of, you know, I wanted sugar all the time. So then I would sort of, but not really. It just like I would gain and lose weight pretty fast. So I think that became a little bit of a pattern, but not to an extreme and, and really synchro in a sense, if anything, it kept me eating well because I had to eat for me to be competing that much. So that was that. And I think in hindsight of, and you know, as in your background as a naturopath, like the different things physiologically that are happening can really be affecting our psyche. And 
I also, in the recent years and in the investigation of my systems, I discovered that it had different things going on with my liver. And that could have been happening since I'm 10 years old. So if your liver is not detoxifying your body well, of course you're getting sort of a coagulation in different systems and it's causing you to not want to eat or to like be hungry because you're not assimilating. So all these things were not being addressed. And I was training 30 hours a week and doing five courses at University of Toronto. There was just it That's was bound amazing to, like, to me. Hit a wall. That is, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'm hearing you say that, and, and I'm actually uh, not a trained naturopath, but I was a homeopathic doctor and a holistic nutritionist. Oh, okay, yes. But that's okay. <laughs> it's, you know, very similar. But, you know, I'm just, yes. it's amazing to me that you were competing at such a high level and all the practice and the training that goes into that. Plus, you were in school, and yet you didn't have anyone around you that was really looking at you as a holistic kind of entity and looking at all these moving parts like I'm sure they do now maybe they do or hopefully they do it 17 years later but it just amazes me to hear that and it sounds like you really just had to figure yourself out afterwards like in the aftermath right exactly and I think <laughs> because I put it all out there in my book so it's interesting because I was kind of a black sheep in a certain way because and I still am maybe as far as chlorine's concerned and chlorine byproducts because mm. I felt like the more I investigated my health down the road after, I saw that I had been uh, very sensitive to chlorine. And especially in indoor pools, what happens is the chlorine byproduct. So it's not actually like the chlorine in the water that harms us. It's when it reacts to skin, hair, urine, yeah. whatever is in the water, that it creates this off-gassing. And that's what's the most hazardous to our health. We breathe it in. It takes like... So all that I found out later, and then I kind of became this champion for bringing healthier filtration systems and air, you know, all that stuff that's really developed and thriving in Europe, especially from Denmark. And I know all the best guys who do the best of the best. I put that in my book, and I spoke about it in different places. But unfortunately, I saw that a lot of pools were either, like, not in a position financially to change their system over, or there was just, like, a non-important Put to it and in that sense some i think of the aquatic sports saw this as like a discouraging aquatic sports but it's really the opposite like i always will you know if my niece wants to do synchronized swimming or swimming like do what brings the child joy but at the same time, why aren't we looking at this? And mm -hmm. I can attest to that know, as well. I had and a it's lot the same of... thing for eating disorders. It's like there's so many comprehensive ways to look at it now that is showing up thanks to like the Institute of Psychology of Eating and a lot of different approaches that are really bringing to the forefront holistic ways of looking at everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. I When I had my clinical practice up and running in the Toronto area, I saw quite a few swimmers, competitive and non. And one of the things that I would always test for, because I did allergy testing at the time, and this method to reassimilate things with your body, it was the off gas. And it used to come up all the time. And I even had, I won't name the name, but an Olympic skater. Mm. Same kind of effect happening with off gassing in the skating rink. So it's amazing. Really? Yeah. And it's amazing. We yeah. don't like think of these things, right? We just think of like, well, you just go and you train and you do your thing. And, and then you started getting sick and, and this disordered eating. And, and it has, it's, it's a cumulative effect that you had to then look at and repair. So let's pick off, pick up from there because you said you were over 200 pounds. You're this Olympic medalist and you're feeling the incongruency. You're over 200 pounds. And what happened then? Well, <laughs> I think the that was a big sigh. Was like, <gasps> I know. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so many segments of this journey, which is great because when I really start working with someone now, I can like, oh wow, like they don't have to go through literally a decade of right. experimenting because you're like, I've done that, that for you. <laughs> they work, you know. And I say that, and you know, I really believe that our soul has lessons to learn, and. If we have a thing with food, like I do, I say I do. I went to AA, no, uh, OA for a while, Overeating Anonymous. And it's not because I don't believe in the system. And I think that a lot of people have great value from that system, obviously. But there was something about saying that I am an addict, like it would stunt the potential growth of my soul because I would be affirming that I was an addict. I believe that we have different, if we want to call it selves, different selves within ourselves. And the addict can be one of them. I have the addict for sure as one of them. 
but I don't believe that I am that addict. So mm. when I started really feeling like how those meetings or things like that would affect me, I thought, interesting, there's a way for me to embrace and accept and love myself even with this. And today, if I am not listening, if I'm really going blindly or overdoing or saying yes when my gut says no and like going down that path, what's going to show up? The addict. And what's going to show up? Overeating. And it's not in a way that I go, oh, my gosh, like, I'm back at this. It's more like, oh, I'm not listening. What's going on? Like, check in. Yeah, it's so just my red flag. It's interesting right? how you speak about that and how you realize. And look, those groups are amazing and 12 Steps and all those anonymous meetings there. They serve a lot of people and they're great. But what I heard you say is that you recognized and I actually had a similar experience with one of those type meetings years and years ago. But what you realized, it wasn't going to be a value to you to identify yourself as the addict and rather just mm -hmm. see it as an archetype or a piece of yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Absolutely. that's a more powerful approach, would you think? Like, I think that that's a more powerful approach. And again, not dogging on those groups, but more about, like, the identity that you take on, you know, not yeah. taking on, like, I am an addict, which may serve you, but for some people it may not. And it looks like you kind of use that in a different way. So I like the way you describe that. Exactly. And I think, so one of the tools that I did find along my journey was tapping EFT that I mentioned earlier. And... I actually checked it initially because if any of you have heard about tapping, it's a form of energy psychology that uses the points of the meridian system that's also used in acupuncture. But instead of putting needles, we're actually tapping. Like you tap on your points while you're just following me. So that's why it's, it can be done through FaceTime or Skype or, or in person. And so while we're tapping, we're actually dismantling. We're, we're getting a thought or an addictive behavior, or actually a memory, a trauma, like we said, the small T or the big T that was maybe in the past that's still causing a static in the nervous system or a trauma, just so like a repetitive thing, that's basically that means it's stored in the reptilian part of your brain, the fight or flight or freeze. Mm -hmm. When we tap and we're actually feeling all those negative things or that negative little sequence of time or mini YouTube in your life, we're actually shifting the energy with the tapping because the tapping sends your body in a parasympathetic response to the forebrain. So what's really cool is like, in the sense, back to our attic conversation, when we're saying something like, even though I'm so upset with myself because I remember that time I binged on chocolate and I got caught, <laughs> I love and accept myself, even though blah, 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 I love and accept myself. So there's, like you can see, we're acknowledging that part of ourselves or that part of our life or that mini YouTube sort of drama scene. And we're also bringing love and compassion. And that's why tapping is such a powerful tool because it helps us dismantle not only, like it, for me, it also helped me organize my emotional landscape. So it wasn't all about like, I'm just stressed and anxious. I'm just stressed and anxious. I started realizing that I had sadness. I had disappointment, I had guilt, I had shame. And tapping on all those separately, it's almost like it brings you peace because it brings order-ish to something that could feel so overwhelming. Because as you know, most of us who have lived on this planet, we've at some point gotten to very overwhelming times in our life, whether relationship is more issue, whether money is more issue, body and, and health. And so and, or all of it, right? We all have this sense of like, how am I going to make it out? Like this, like, ah. And I think tapping has been a really instrumental tool. And funny enough, I found it online through this free tapping for chocolate cravings, like little sort of Perfect. free book. <laughs> and I got that and I like followed it. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. And I was like, you know, being my perfectionist self, like tapping every day or whatever it was. And I was actually in the shows in Vegas uh, at that time. And I actually didn't see a result. Like I felt better, but then I would see myself binging again on sugar and on chocolate. And I was like, what the hell, what the hell? So it wasn't until later, uh, one of my fellow uh, great friends, and he's an awesome coach as well. And he was like, Kat, you should investigate tapping. And I said, oh, I actually did it. I don't think it works. So I did this, this, and this. He's like, no, but it's because you need to use it like this and you need to go back to the original cause that is actually causing the anxiety that's causing the sugar craving. 
So I really saw it differently and I jumped right into a certification because I knew no matter what, I'd get benefits for myself. And I did. That's how tapping became one of my primary like mental emotional tools that I've kept using over the years, even though I've dabbed into others for myself. And even though I do a couple more things, I feel like that's like a good staple because it's really powerful and it's super powerful. Once you kind of, yeah, once you learn it, you really can use it on yourself. You can use it on your little ones. I mean, my little five-year-old niece is on, we've had maybe a month of tapping. She's like, oh, I'm done with my pink energy bubble because I don't get angry anymore. And she literally is like, my little tapping friend. <laughs> we FaceTime and she's totally getting it. My brother's like, can I learn it? <laughs> and his, his dad, her dad. So it's just fun because it's easy and yet profound. Yeah, I love it. I love it myself. I'll use it with my clients. I use it with myself mostly. And I remember, oh, I've, oh gosh, I heard of tapping years ago and it was part of some of the technique that I used in my clinical practice as well. And the, the guy that I learned it from had a different name for it. It was still based on tapping, but it was like holistic something or other. It was like a holistic EFT. I'm, I forget the name of it, but we learned it as part of our, of our work that we do with people too. And it is, it's really profound. And I, I heard Nick Ortner, who's one of the kind of known people for tapping, uh, talking about it and saying the same thing that you were saying, how it really helps to create the space in your nervous system to create something new because we're so bogged down by all the stresses and that really shuts down any kind of creative sort of problem solving. It's amazing. Totally. It's an amazing tool. Yeah. I would love to know, cause you work, I mean, you work with some really amazing, you know, achievers and top athletes, including actors and amazing people. And I would love to know because we see people and we see that they've achieved all this and we tend to put them on a pedestal, don't we? We say, well, they're on a pedestal and mm -hmm. they're perfect and they have their shit all figured out. I don't but they do. And I always love when I interview people and even when I myself work with people that are top performers and known in a sense, because they're just real people. They're just like you and I. So I would love to know how you've been able to use not just EFT, but your other gifts and skills to help these people, you know, in their game really of life. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I saw was that our bodies carry so much memory and cellular memory is real. And so what I saw, especially for athletes and being one myself, I started in my own healing process years ago. I dabbed into different things and I fell upon different systems that used a good amount of pressure to kind of like walk on the back of your legs or to stretch and resist and to do things that I currently do now because if we're not really moving the body, we're kind of like missing a big piece of the pie. And I feel like maybe athletes, especially once you have an exploration of their body and because I've become more intuitive in the body mind connection, well, different, if, if you know any of uh, Louise Hay's work and heal your body, heal your life, you know, all of that, it really is real. I've been blown away because even like, I think it was two years ago, I was getting this pain in my, and I'll get back to your question, but this is proves a, an interesting point because even me as someone who studied the Chinese meridian theories and all that stuff, sometimes I stop there like, what if it was all made up? <laughs> what if it's not even true? Everything is Healthy like totally skepticism. made up. Yeah, it's like, well, what if the liver didn't mean that you're, it's creating your life? Or what if the gallbladder wasn't about decision making? It's all made up, you know? And then I basically had this point of my knuckle of my index finger really sore all of a sudden. Like, am I getting arthritis? Like, that doesn't make sense. And then my big right toe was like stuck. And I was like, that's interesting. That's really bothering me, blah, blah, blah. Then I do like different tasks. I had had this chronic fatigue kind of thing that I knew wasn't chronic fatigue. It was like, something's up. And finally, we, we investigate and I have this liver condition, which I'm, I'm in like 80% solving right now. But yeah, so I realized then, I'm like, I'm going to track this liver meridian. Where is it? And of course, the liver meridian runs exactly through the two points that have been chronically off and on creating pain in my body. And it's like the only organ that shows up as like weak in my test. So I was like, okay, this is interesting because even when I'm a skeptic, I am shown pretty mm -hmm. plain, <laughs> obvious, <laughs> like really cat. Totally. So, but sometimes this kind of conversation is not something I'm going to start with, with an athlete that may be only like having not even a mini toe in the water of the body mind connection. 
I can right. know it for myself, but I might not voice it. And something like tapping that really looks kind of weird because you're tapping on yourself. I will start only once I've had maybe a breakthrough and like, wow, I really feel better. My shoulder posture is better because I've done these different stretchings with them. Or I've applied the reflexive performance reset, which really gets you into diaphragm and breathing that can help activate the glutes and the psoas, which athletes really feel. And us normal day people now that sit on our chairs or drive or fly a lot, we all kind of end up, or a lot of people I've met, end up with either lower back pain or neck pain. Yeah, uh, you'll have to teach me that one. (laughs) Yeah, or that hip flexor thing where you're like, feel like you have a ball in front of your hip flexor. And those things can actually be solved quicker than we think. And so with these kinds of reflex points, I end up having this like, oh, wow, cool. And once you have an, oh, wow, cool, as you know, you start trusting someone. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to go deeper in, let's say, the emotional side. And like, while we were talking about, let's say, we're exploring or or I'm having them relax and walking on the back of their legs and they're more relaxed. And then they say something about their boyfriend or their girlfriend or something about their dad. And I said, oh, well, you know what? Like, I want to show you something. And then I end up going right into tapping. And then it's like, holy cow, I want to do this like more. (laughs) So that's how I saw it. And in a way, I fell into it that way. It's not like I right away believed in all these tools. I only believe in what I currently offer Mm -hmm. because they really created a result. Yeah, it's like a, it's a backdoor approach because you're right. Not everybody is open to these alternative ways of healing or approaching things. And like I had the, even though people would be coming to like a holistic healing clinic, you'd be surprised the amount of skeptics I would have coming in. And you have to start where the person is at. You have to present with Mm -hmm. where they're at right now. And I love that you kind of work it in once you've built trust and rapport And what are you finding for these people like using, because I could see the way, you know, EFT and a lot of these techniques have helped me in my personal life with anxiety and mostly anxiety, but anxiety and depression and all these other mental states and spin states as I call them. But how do you see it working in these athletes and top performers? Are you seeing their performance improve? Are you seeing their game get better or like their personal lives? Like, is it sort of across the board? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think there needs to be a willingness to play. Like I see coaching and I I know you do the the same. It's like, I see it as like a two way street and Mm -hmm. the most not open-minded, even just like people who really want it all. You can tell that's how far it can go. And I see it as like for one player, she's a golfer and it's like, there's a level of certainty, a level of presence. And presence is becoming more and more of a desire for people because we hear it mindfulness and it's like, I want to just be present when my kids are talking to me. Like, why do I like branch out? But for something to improve, you have to have a goal. You have to have tools to get there. And I think like, if I wish I had that as a, even as an athlete, it's like, okay, the result, the score in the game, and then the level of certainty, confidence, like kick ass, kind of like I'm the best attitude. And then there's a level of presence. And what if, your score, whether it be golf, skating, anything, speed, like track came in as one thing. And then, you know, percentage scale, how present were you? And then on a certainty scale, how certain were you? Or how confident did you feel? And I really believe in a model that all three scores, whether it be sport, business, family, or relationship, love, connection, all three should really over time come together. Because that's from which you want to play. And I think that I'm only the beginning of, I believe, a long-term career in this because that's my passion of bringing a level of performance and winning with the personal growth as much of a priority, with health and wellness long-term as much of a priority. And I believe them to be converging so that actually the athlete becomes more of a winner. But that said we need to do it in a smart kind of way. One coach told me this in a coaching session for me, because if you discover, let's say that you're negatively, you're not negatively, but you're primary, you're primary, my French Canadian is coming out. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Uh, Your primary motivator has actually been negative. So for me, I will be honest and say that I think one of my main drivers has been to 
be the best in the sense of like, I'll get you back because I've been alone or I haven't been like, I'll I'll show you kind of way. I'll show you because you didn't include me. Mm. And it's like so crazy how I discovered this over like over years of like investing, like, what is it? It's so subtle, but there's like a subtle, like, eh, like the competition, like the, the, my inner competitor is really strong, but I'm also so much fun and like sort of bubbly and nice. Like I'm also a pleaser that that little competitor self was very subtle and sneaky. But when I finally saw it, I was like, wow, that's actually my driver. So I actually expect to get rejected and not included because then it kicks on my competitor, which is my main driver. And then I'm like, I'll show you. So of course Mm. I've been like, you know, going to these weird cycles of not feeling satisfied in the way that I was getting somewhere. And just to cut in there, how many of us have these unconscious drivers that are creating our life we don't even yeah. know why we're getting into the states we're getting into and like you said sometimes you're conscious or unconsciously creating an undesirable state to get you into what you want to be into or like to get you into a more desirable state and it's so fascinating to me that we do this i mean i do it we all do it we have these unconscious drivers and i just i wanted to just point that out for the audience just to take a minute and kind of look at your life and where you're creating situations where you seemingly are creating drama or you're creating feelings that don't feel good and we have this saying that goes around in personal development which is you know you must be getting something out of it and usually our first thought is no we're not but Yeah, we are. If it's an unconscious driver, we're totally getting something out of it, right? Totally. Yeah, I was getting a huge thing out of rejection. And I still catch myself doing it. I will attract it and then go, oh, and then I was like, oh, my God, here it is again. (laughs) So it's good. But that said, I'm, I'm saying this because if you take away your negative driver and you're not replacing it with a positive driver that's like really ready to be in place, you might really be like, not Mm. functional (laughs) and so especially for athletes that are already at the top of their game like really you can't really remove something that big without making sure that the new guy the new voice the new fierceness of winning to be the best or winning to just feel so innerly satisfied that could be dangerous and my work could go down the tubes if I did that so I know that line and I'm very aware of it. It's a fine line to like, okay, I'm going to creep up the presence, creep up the acceptance and love, but make sure that the driver that could have been in most cases, I mean, really, to be honest, a lot of top athletes, as for me, were driven by a skeleton in the closet. And it's important to like really kind of dismantle and build and dismantle and build and not remove everything and leave the person like, oh my God, I'm losing now. (laughs) You know, because I just want to be Miss like Pollyanna or whatever it is. That's really important that you said that, Catherine. I'm I'm so happy that you actually do that work with people, um, especially since you and I are going to be doing some work together (laughs) tomorrow. Yeah, right. You know, it's so important that you do that piece of the work because I think, you know, I can't say a lot of schools of thought, but there's been times in the past where I see that we focus on the moving of something but you're right if you don't actually you know install or replace Mm -hmm. that driver you're really leaving a gap in the psyche or in the nervous system and our we'll try and find a way to fill it with something else or we'll be in that state of like now what you know I just like you're not even functional like you said and there's pieces that I'm so happy that you brought that up because that's super important in this day and age where we're trying to fix or get rid of stuff or like scoop stuff out. You know, we have to make sure that we're replacing the primary things that drive us. I love that. I love that you said that. Yeah, I think it's something that I, I'm still grappling with myself as far as how much can I really let go of the need <laughs> for rejection to be then driven, you know? Yeah. And it's like, wow, you know, I could keep it if I wanted to, but I also see it as like the lazy part when I feel lazy. And I think we also, I, a lot of people get into the zone is because our drivers somehow aren't going and we're all, all of a sudden we're like, oh, I don't even care anymore. I don't give a, ugh. Give us an example of that. I'm putting myself in the listener's shoes and I'm thinking there's somebody that's going to be listening right now and is going to be mm-hmm. saying, how do I know? How do I identify what my driver is? And how do I, you know, they might not be able to figure out how to replace it and install something new on their own. They're probably going to have to get help for that. But mm-hmm. how can somebody who's listening identify 
that this is a driver, meaning I'm getting mm -hmm. something out of mm -hmm. this. There, this is something, even though I, it seems negative, how can we identify that? Mm -hmm. I think a, a nice way or process that's coming to mind right now, it's kind of two in one, but could be like when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling overwhelmed or you're doubting yourself, whatever it is for you that gets to that intense moment or state, you can ask yourself, when's the first or the worst time that I felt this? And really go back and go back in time when you're little, when, you know, maybe in your teen years, whatever it is that really feels like that same kind of feeling. When's the worst or the first time? First or worst. And when you're in that scene, so in a sense, this is kind of process we use in tapping, but it can be used even without tapping. You can go back and see in that maybe you're doing it now. Like think about that time or even if you're sitting listening to this going, oh my God, I'm so fed up of being this certain way or a few days ago when you were really stressed or whatever. Now track it back. When's the first or the worst time you felt that? And if you have that in mind, now you're in a mini YouTube capsule. If your, your life was a long movie and it's all separated in mini YouTubes, you're probably at one of the like kind of intense YouTube videos, right? Because you felt that, like you remember it, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Now this is something we might tap on, but we don't have to. You can literally, I have a ha-ha now because you can ask yourself, okay, what was happening then? And what did I conclude out of that? Did I decide because I felt rejected that I was going to do this? Did I decide because I wasn't safe that I needed to do, I do it all. And now you've become a do it all and you can't even ask for help. Maybe you decided in that moment that you weren't lovable because someone really hurt you or said something nasty about you. And then you became someone that has to always prove your worth. Mm. So just investigate what was really happening if you look at that. Yeah, and be curious. And without, yeah, be curious. And so you might have an aha that you want to write it down because now just having that awareness, you're going to start looking at, okay, interesting. If this is my driver, how much am I attracting it? Remember, because if it's a driver, it's also actually made you productive, actually made you who you are today. Because there's so, a flip side to that driver. There's a good, yeah. That works for you. So for example, if you felt, you know, unworthy or left out, and as a result, that became a driver for you to become a people pleaser, we might look at the mm -hmm. negative side of people pleaser and say, well, that's not good. That hasn't served me. But actually, there's a part of that that maybe has served you because maybe you've gone the extra mile. Maybe you've gotten involved in service. Maybe, you know, that's what you're saying, right? Like there's a positive side yes. to that. Yeah. Yes. And if you didn't feel safe, and you became super productive. Like you were like, I'm going to, your parents didn't make you feel safe. So you're like, I got to rule the house. Like I got to like do it all and get it happening. You might be super achieving. Like really, you might be a, a doctor. You might be whatever it is, but. You might be an Olympic also, medalist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but you also feel this like, gosh, I can't let myself relax. I can't watch a movie without like thinking I should be doing something else or there's other costs to it. And it's like, what if you could actually be a performer from a positive driver? And so again, we, if we go back in moment right now, and you go back to that scene, that mini YouTube video, without even tapping on it, you can talk to the little self, the little girl, or the teenager girl, and just talk to her and say, Hey, I'm okay, you're okay, I've got your back. And kind of like ask her like, Hey, if you knew that you were so amazing and you didn't have to prove anything anymore and you were actually safe and who cares if those girls rejected you, you were actually super cool. And you know, it's kids Kids do that. It's like really talk to that little girl or teenage girl, even adult, maybe that's where it took you and just see how you can bring that kind of energy more and more into your life because you know, yes, tools are effective. And I would say like, if it wasn't for some of these tools, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> I might be in my car driving through a Tim Hortons. You um, might be. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, it's, at the same, 
It's super, Go ahead. you know, I was going to say it's super important because we often think on this journey of personal development and improving ourselves and, and we think we have to like fix stuff that's broken, but it's not about being broken. It's actually just about integrating the wholeness of who you are. So it's not getting rid of that piece because it's causing havoc in our life. It's keeping the parts of it that are serving you and discarding or bringing to healness and acceptance the parts that are maybe wreaking havoc. So I like it because this is a true, um, it's very similar to, you know, work I've done on myself personally and that I do now with people. It, it's a true integrative way of healing and coaching the best out of a person, right? It's not about chopping things out and fixing broken pieces. It's about integration. So I love it. Wow. This has been so great, Catherine. I've really, really enjoyed having you on the show. It was wonderful talking to you and hearing about everything that you do out there in the world now and especially sharing these pieces with us. I think that a lot of people listening are going to get some value from that. Same here. Thank you so much. And I do have a, what's it called? It's kind of like a, an introduction to tapping document, but it's also really cool because if you have tried tapping, and a lot of people have nowadays, either you have or you haven't, there is a video, you can learn it and just tap along. It's an example of overwhelm. And then there is more like why tapping wouldn't be working. And so I have those in the document so you can look through it and go, oh, interesting. And even if you were just starting on your tapping path, you'll know what to look for and what to make sure you, if it's not me, someone that's your practitioner, or if you're on your own, you're doing it in the most specific way so that you actually do get long-term results and not just like state change in the moment that kind of goes away. Cool. <laughs> so actually. that's the important parts of why tapping can work or not. Thank you for that. We'll put the link in the show notes and you can find out more about Catherine in the show notes and everything that she's up to. Activatinghighperformance.com is her website. And like I said, we'll put that gift from Catherine in our show notes. Catherine, it was such a pleasure again to have you on and I can't wait for our session tomorrow. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. <laughs> Yay. All right, yeah, girl. I'm very grateful for our, our exchanges and how much we can make a difference for women. And I'm really excited and totally cheer you on in all that you're doing in the world. Oh, you're so sweet. You're so sweet. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks again. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in and keep rising everyone for books and resources related to today's episode make sure you head over to sherisespodcast.com and i'll see you there if you've enjoyed today's episode make sure you tune back in next week when i dive into more juicy topics to help make your life the best it can be and hey if you've enjoyed listening to the show and you love it head on over to itunes and leave me a rate and review and subscribe there to the show 